Hi, my name is Alicia Demi, and today I would like to start a conversation about depression. Trigger warning, the topics of self-harm, depression, abuse, and narcissistic abuse. Please keep in mind I'm not a professional of any kind relating to mental health. I'm just a YouTuber. I'm going to be sharing some more outside-of-the-box opinions that aren't necessarily on board with medication and pharmaceuticals. So if you feel that listening to those kinds of opinions would be damaging for you, maybe don't listen to this. So in my completely unprofessional and uneducated opinion, I've come to feel that depression comes a lot more from trauma and from your psychology and the way that you think about things in your life and how your thoughts are and the you know chemical reactions and whatnot in your body and feelings and emotions that come as a result of what your thoughts are that may sound really invalidating but it is supposed to hopefully sound empowering because we do have some amount of power and control over our thoughts and the way that we process traumas. And this is me evaluating my own personal experience, which is limited, of course. I don't know everyone's experience with depression. But for me, a depressive episode, which could last anywhere from one day to multiple days, um, to an overall feeling that lasts for months with just a few happier times sprinkled throughout them, always starts with a trigger and or an intrusive thought, which spirals out of control and ends up getting from something like a loved one doing or saying something hurtful, which triggers a trauma and an insecurity, or a thought about myself that I have when I'm trying to do something um, that then spirals and eventually gets to a landing place of maybe I don't want to exist and I've not struggled with um, any kind of engaging in the actual physical act of self-harm, but I have struggled with suicidal ideation types of thoughts um, before in my life and they always happen after this trigger and then cycle of negative thinking. I find for me that when it does get to that point where there is the ideation, a lot of it has to do with a overwhelming and consuming desire to be treated differently or for love from certain people who are not really capable of giving that love as well as really toxic self-loathing thoughts that, you know, no one cares about me, would anyone actually care if I didn't exist anymore? Those types of thoughts, which we know are never really true, they're just kind of the depression speaking. Like, that's never true for anyone. There's always people that care about you and love you, no matter who you are. It's just that our mind and our negative psychology does a really good job, sadly, of convincing us of that. But it's never actually true. And the worst thing that you can do when you're in this state is to isolate yourself and be alone. The best thing you can do is talk to your loved ones and your people. And if not, of course, there are strangers online and or professionals. I will leave the hotlines and everything in the description. Because even if you do come to this point in life where you feel like all of your family and friends have betrayed you or you can't relate with them or you don't belong with them or you, whatever it might be, you can always create your family and find new friends. It's never like the end. You're never doomed when it comes to that. So researching about positive psychology and doing things like affirmation and meditation and things like that, reprogramming your subconscious, reprogramming the way that you think are extremely helpful as long as you don't get into toxic positivity, which is where you pretend everything's okay when it's not, or try and suppress and ignore any feelings that are negative. 
So there's a huge difference between what's helpful and what's not, and I have another video about that to help you differentiate. So again, in my very unprofessional, don't take me too seriously because I'm just a YouTuber opinion, that can be a really good place to start if you are not at any kind of risk or desiring to physically harm yourself. Um, and if you are, again, talk to the professionals. Just know that there's always someone out there that cares and that wants to listen and that you are worthy to be alive and that you are worthy to be here simply because you are here. I think it can also be helpful to hear other people's stories of profound transformation where they used to be having thoughts of self-harm um, or even attempts of self-harm and have completely turned their life around and knowing that that is possible and that is possible for you and it can be possible for you simply because you decide it to be possible. We have a lot of power. There's a lot of things in trauma and in society that want to convince us of the opposite of that, but really we do have a lot of power in our own selves to create our lives and to change our lives. It is possible to observe those thoughts without going down the spiral that I was talking about earlier and completely getting swept up and consumed by it. It is possible to learn how to observe it instead and how to regularly practice doing that to the point where they happen a lot less often and then also to the point where when they do happen you can see it for what it is and not get swept up in it. There's a good YouTuber named Hitomi Machizuki who talks a lot about this. She has attempted suicide and come out to this point where she can just observe the thoughts and they don't happen as often. But that being said, it is important not to promote meditation and mindfulness and positive psychology as the be all end all of complete cures or anything like that and to know that you can still be doing all of these things and doing everything right and still struggle and that's kind of where I'm at right now. However, trying and engaging in these things could never hurt as long as you're not engaging in toxic positivity, right? So why not try them? Why not utilize these tools to help make things even a little bit better? What I've come to figure out recently in my own personal experience is that when I've hit this wall where I feel like I'm so frustrated, I'm doing everything right, I'm going to therapy every week, I'm meditating every day, I'm saying affirmations, I'm doing all these things to engage in positive psychology, and yet I'm still spiraling when a trigger or a negative self-loathing thought comes up. What gives? What do I do? And I, f I think I realized that Sometimes when I hit this wall, for me, it has a lot to do with not feeling understood um, and just not having someone I can talk to in my life that knows what the struggle is and that has the struggle themselves or has at one point had the struggle. Not having someone to talk to who understands and having someone to talk to who understands what you're going through is huge because that combats loneliness. I realized that outside of my relationship with my boyfriend who does not struggle with his mental health and who does not, from his own experience firsthand, understand what I go through, as well as my mom who doesn't really understand depression, it felt, it felt like nobody understood. And I realized that I was isolating myself from everyone who wasn't just those two individuals and that that wasn't healthy. I won't get into the reasons why I was isolating myself, but when I made a, and I don't advocate for social media use very much, but when I put out something on my Facebook page saying what I was going through and that I needed people to talk to, I was so, heartwarmingly surprised at who showed up to talk to me as well as the amount of people that did and I would definitely encourage putting out something like that publicly in that way. Which is why vulnerability is huge. 
I hope that you can find the strength to be vulnerable and share what you're going through. It's a lot easier to do this to strangers than it is sometimes to the people in your life if you don't have any closeness and intimacy with the people in your life, which happens a lot with people who are depressed. That contributes to why they're kind of depressed in the first place, in my opinion. There's a really good, and I would say life-changing TED talk by Brene Brown about shame and vulnerability. If you would take time to just listen to that, I think it would help change your life. Uh, just learning how to be vulnerable and have these difficult conversations because a lot of the times those can solve things a lot more than you would think that they would. Another thing that's important that I've learned to remember about my practice of meditation and mindfulness is that you have to walk your talk. You have to literally take the things that you are learning and enact them every day and not just when you're in a good mood because it is so easy to wake up and happily exclaim your affirmations and feel positive when it's just a day where you already feel lighter hearted and you're not having so much of a depressed day that day. Um, I find that there's fluctuations of highs and lows a lot um, for myself. But anyways, it's easy to use these tools when you're in that state. It is not easy to use these tools when you are feeling depressed, when you have already rode the negative thought spiral down to the point of seemingly no return. So we should use the mindfulness tools and exercises to prevent the negative thought spiral, for, first of all. But if we don't, because nobody is perfect and life isn't perfect, then we need to know and practice how to have these default kind of like, okay, what is the plan? I'm here now. What is the plan? Let me try to remember. Okay, talk to someone. If anything else, just remember that one thing. Talk to someone. Talk to someone who is kind and respectful and who understands and who's not like an abuser or a toxic person. And then after that, or in conjunction with that, you can remind yourself about breathing techniques. Um, you can attempt meditation. It's not always appropriate or something that would work, but sometimes it is, sometimes it does help. And then things like asking yourself, where's this thought coming from? Where did I first hear this thought in my life? What trauma does this thought come from? This is where you have to do a lot of self-work to uncover your traumas and a lot of times you need professional help and therapy to help you do that. And then the person that you talk to will hopefully help you do this, but to kind of reframe these thoughts, see them for what they are, not get so consumed by them, and maybe even replace them with better thoughts that are even just as simple as, well, maybe things aren't as bad as these thoughts are trying to tell me they are. Especially if your inner child or inner teenager or whatever is wounded. Um, oh, there's a squirrel. Hold on. I'm not even like trying to make an ADHD joke. There literally is a squirrel. <laughs> I guess that's a sign that I should mention that ADHD and depression can go hand in hand a lot and if you struggle with that it can you know you can also struggle with depression and i think a lot of the reason for that is because when you're not neurotypical it's just you face a lot of difficulties and challenges and even people being mean to you about your difficulties with fitting into a society that isn't really kind of made for you to thrive in and again i don't take any medication i don't really believe in medication for ADHD. I believe more in just changing what you do so that it is something that you thrive at. And no, ADHD isn't really like, oh, look, a squirrel. That's just like a really cliche joke. What it actually is, there's different kinds, but for me, how it actually manifests in my life is um, like, trouble with adulting, 
trouble with working at a traditional nine to five job. Trouble sometimes with time management and it's actually more to do with hyper focusing on stuff than the lack of ability to focus actually. It's more of like you get latched onto something and you obsess over it than it is a struggle with focusing because when something is your passion, when you're engaged in something and in the flow state, it's actually easier for people with ADHD to focus for a long period of time doing those things. It's just that sometimes that comes at the expense of other things happening in your day. Fantastic for getting done a piece of artwork or working on a project or doing work that you're passionate in. Horrible for if you have negative thoughts or worries because you latch onto them and you over obsess on them. In our society, we put so much worth on career and money and traditional ways of success. And when you're not neurotypical and you fail over and over at those things, which isn't really failing, but for lack of a better word, combined with, you know, so that feeling of like, oh, I can't do anything combined with the people around you saying like, oh my God, like this isn't that hard. Why are you struggling? Or, you know, I can't believe you quit this again or dropped out of that again. It does not help with depression and self-esteem. I personally think it's just a lot better to accept and embrace exactly the way you are with ADHD and realize all the positive things that come with it, like having a pretty cool personality and having most likely artistic talents and just being like a cool ass person and just doing what you are good at and what you do thrive in and paying someone else to, I don't know, do your taxes or help you out with finances. Um, you know, just reallocating activities you're not good at to other people and just staying with what you are good at and then finding a way to make money on that, which is what I'm in the process and path toward doing. Just giving yourself things that you know you will hyper-focus on that are positive and good things that are creative instead of things that are destructive, like your negative, horrible thoughts. And also using mindfulness to realize, okay, I'm feeling the urge to over-focus on this. I'm feeling the urge to lash out about this, and I'll get to lashing out in a minute. But I am choosing not to, and I'm choosing to redirect my attention towards something else. So as a sensitive person who has certain triggers and things, first of all, it's a good idea to write down what your triggers are and let your romantic partner, your family members and friends know what your triggers are. Not so that they have to like tiptoe around you or walk on eggshells not to set you off or anything like that, but just so that they can be aware. Like for example, um, I, I'm fine with it now, but I used to be really triggered by being called dumb or anything that insulted my intelligence because again, as an ADHD kid growing up, there was a certain person in my life at the time who would really bully me for those difficulties and it used to really trigger me and now I've overcome it, I'm happy to say. But you know, you, there's no necessity for someone to call you a name. It's not like they have to change their whole life around to just not call you a certain name if that is one of your triggers. You want to be aware of what your triggers are and be working towards making them not a trigger anymore, but constantly getting triggered and getting your nervous system into that fight or flight over and over with it is not the way to do that. We can't work through anything if we don't have our basic needs of feeling safe. But even with all of that, triggers are still inevitable and you shouldn't expect to live your life without any triggers. Um, you really need to learn how to apply mindfulness to them. But you know, we're not perfect. So something to really become aware of is that if a trigger hits you, particularly if it's already a day where you're not happy and thriving 
and it's more of a day where you're struggling with depression or whatever it might be. You are at risk for lashing out at people because of that trigger for something that has nothing to do with them and everything to do with you. And not only do you, of course, not want to hurt others, but you know, if you're a compassionate, empathetic person, more than likely, if you do lash out a little bit and it doesn't have to be screaming at the person and over the top, if you're like doing anything abusive, then please get help. But if you're listening to my video, that's probably not the case. You're probably a survivor of abuse, not like an abuser. But anyway, tangent aside, if you lash out just by having a bad tone or start, if you have ADHD, hyper-focusing on something negative toward the person, the guilt that you feel later, just like, oh shit, I did it again, I always do this, what's wrong with me, there's something wrong with me, I'm always looking for everything negative, is not helpful, of course. So you want to become aware of this lashing out and try to prevent that as much as possible. This is where you have to forgive yourself and you have to engage in self-compassion, validate your own feelings, give yourself kindness, especially if there's no one immediately around you that will do that. You can't always completely depend on others. You have to be able to provide that for yourself. Read this really good book called Self-Compassion. Make apologies when it is really truly necessary, when you did cross a line or you did say something you didn't wanna say or have a tone or whatever it might be, but also don't over apologize to the point where you apologize for existing as a human. Some days truly are harder than others and some days you just are depressed and it's better to just accept that and give yourself self-compassion than it is to beat yourself up about it and allow others to make you feel guilty about it. Like, why are you always like this? Why are you upset? You have nothing to be upset about. And we'll get to validating feelings here in a second. The truth is that sometimes, especially if you have traumas, sometimes you just feel shitty and you just wake up and feel shitty. And there's no like, li like, there's no immediate thing that happened in your present day that caused that. It could just be leftover energy or feelings that are coming out to be released or whatever. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to beat yourself up about it and just make everything worse. It's a lot better to just accept that you're having a day like this and be open to it changing, maybe halfway through the day it shifts and you feel better again. Be open to resting. Um, this is why it's good for people who struggle a lot with this to where it gets in the way of them functioning as an adult, to have a type of career where they are their own boss and they can take a day on a whim if they need to take a day on a whim because if you don't do that sometimes and you try to force your way through things, for me, it has led to just like crying meltdowns in public or, you know, just making everything worse. And for this reason, you need to get really real with the people that you live with or that are close in your life that this is something that happens and that it's nothing to do with them and that it just happens and they need to not make you feel worse about it. They need to not like shame or guilt you for it. I think a lot of people will use substances and drugs to just when this happens. And I feel it is a lot better to just get to a point where you can be able to move through it and accept it and feel it and still be okay afterwards and not need to turn to something to numb it or suppress it because that's never a true solution. That's always just putting it to later and destroying your health and possibly your life in the process. So don't do that. Having a day or a few hours or a few days where you are just, I'm feeling something, I am moving through emotions. I just wish our society could accept that more and be like, okay, is there anything you need? You know, like, can I make you a meal today or whatever? 
instead of being like, oh, you're always like this. Like, why do you do this? You know, that kind of stuff. Because first of all, you're not always like this. Most people who struggle are not always struggling. And second of all, all human emotions should be accepted and validated. It shouldn't be like, oh, some are good, some are bad. They just are. And there shouldn't be this stigma and judgment around them. It should just be seen as a human having a full human experience and being at a certain stage and having a certain experience. So validating feelings. A lot of the times, all you need in a moment of struggle is to either validate your own feelings, for example, you know, give yourself a hug. Oh, this is really difficult right now. It's understandable that you're reacting this way. It's understandable that you're feeling this way. And it can be nice when other people validate it, but you want to get to the point where you can validate your own feelings first. But yeah, it's important, especially in relationships, to always validate each other's feelings. Because listen, this is a hard truth that I have realized recently. Everyone's feelings and emotions are valid. Like period, they are. Before you try and argue, no, not all thought processes that lead to those feelings and emotions are valid. Absolutely not. Sometimes those thought processes that lead to those feelings are based on lies. They're based on negative things that our mind has made up. Sometimes, be careful, you don't want to get into gaslighting. But sometimes that can be the case. Sometimes you can have misunderstood or misinterpreted someone or a situation. And those misinterpretations can lead to the feelings. But the feelings themselves are happening as a result of the thought processes. And therefore, they are valid. If you're not a master manipulator, the emotions that you're showing are not something that you're making up to get sympathy or making up for whatever kind of reason. In any kind of relationship problem, step one should always be validate each other's feelings. I understand that you feel this way. It's valid for you to feel this way. Your emotions are valid. What you're experiencing, what you're feeling is valid. And then after that, a feeling of safety is fostered in both parties and then you can discuss and tell each other, okay, this is the story that my thoughts are telling myself about this situation. Let me know if I have made a mistake or the, thought, the thoughts have made a mistake along the line somewhere in the story that they have created about this. That's something I learned from Brene Brown. Because oftentimes it can go like this. This is a story I'm telling myself. My thoughts are telling me that because you did this, you don't love me. And then of course the other person can be like, that's ridiculous, of course I love you, blah, 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 blah. Or you can tell your friend, oh, because you didn't show up at this thing, this is the story I'm telling myself about why you didn't show up. And then they can be like, oh no, it's not that at all. It's actually blah, blah, blah. And be careful though, because be careful that you're not talking to an abuser or a narcissist. It'll be a huge red flag if the person you're trying to have this kind of conversation with, maybe explain to them first the exercise, but it'll be a huge red flag if they're unwilling to do it. A lot of times we're just looking for our feelings to be validated because it's a confusing world out there and not even that as much as just looking for it not to be invalidated because having your emotions and feelings invalidated, especially if it's gaslighting, is really horrible and hard to deal with and makes depression a lot worse. Like, there's such a relief that comes off from feeling understood, talking to someone who understands you, and then also even if they don't understand you, from the person just saying like, that your feelings are valid. It's like, whew. So let's talk about abuse and narcissistic abuse. We can't not talk about that because if you come from that, your feelings were constantly invalidated. I will leave resources in the description of professionals who know what they're talking about more than me, explaining what narcissistic abuse and the different kinds of abuse and signs of abuse and all that good stuff 
I'll link that in the, de the description. I also have other videos where I go more in depth about it. I don't want to go too in depth about it in this video so it's not too long. But I want to kind of paraphrase something that a YouTuber therapist said in a video. I forgot his name. I'll flash it on the screen. His videos are extremely helpful because he does something unique where he actually enacts role plays where you have like say a narcissistic mother and a daughter and they'll be on the phone and he'll act two roles and it, it just makes it very illuminating and clear like oh that's how my relationship with my mother is oh that's what this is it's very validating and helpful but anyways he says so going back to when you're a kid or a teenager and you're emotionally reacting to something so the quote is kind of like you were having a normal reaction to a very abnormal situation. So say an adult mistreating you or a situation that's unhealthy, abnormal, etc. So your reaction to it was normal. The situation itself and what was being done was not normal, but you did not have any healthy adults in your reality to reaffirm that your reaction was normal. So from this can be born a pattern of vacillating between getting upset by things and then hating yourself for getting upset by those things. Feeling like you shouldn't have gotten upset. It wasn't valid for you to get upset. I shouldn't be so bothered by this. Why am I upset by this? You know, invalidating yourself. Can you see how going into self-loathing like, oh, I can't believe I made a fuss about something. I can't believe I brought something up. I should have just not been triggered by this. I should have not been bothered by this. I shouldn't feel this way. Oh, I'm always just looking for problems. Oh, I'm never perceiving reality right. And how much worse that makes you feel. Like something's wrong with you. You're broken. You just always got your feelings hurt for no reason and nobody likes you because of that because no one wants to be around someone that's always like that. You know, how that can spiral into that I would like to not exist place versus, oh, this is one of my triggers. Yeah, it makes sense because of this trauma, why I'm feeling this way. Ooh, this really hurts. Yeah, I'm just gonna like breathe through it and sit through it and, you know, maybe do some self-care. Uh, maybe ask for space if I need space, maybe talk to someone if I need to talk to someone, but my feelings are completely valid. And then if you add on top of that people in your life who are also willing to validate those feelings for you, it's just like resistance makes stronger. And when you don't resist it, it won't be stronger. And then do you see how being kind to yourself steers you away from that bottom pit that you could otherwise spiral to? Self-compassion. Or, ooh, this person really wronged me in this situation. Like, I'm valid and I don't have to question, you know, if I feel that they wronged me, then they have wronged me. And maybe I can get a therapist to confirm or deny that to be safe, but maybe I can actually validate that I've been hurt by something and that I deserve to feel upset. And it makes it so much worse if you still have an active gaslighter in your life telling you things like, you just love to feel sorry for yourself. You just want people to feel sorry for you. You just want attention. You're playing victim. Um, you just love to be miserable, things like that. But if you've already become aware of abuse and cut out people that you may have needed to cut out or set boundaries with them, and you're already at this point where there's not someone gaslighting you, you doesn't mean like, oh, I'm healed now, oh, everything's good, you know, you still get triggered and trusting people is still an everyday thing to work on. And you can be at the point where you have really good people in your life, but people are not perfect and sometimes they might make a mistake here and there that messes with your trust and you have to be aware and mindful of the tendency that you will have because of what you've been through to take that thing, especially if it's not a deal breaker, and be overly terrified that that means that they're like people in your past, that they're gonna start doing the same thing now and kind of freaking out and then looking for ways in which 
they might be another abuser or they might be harming you when really maybe they're not. Um, that can be a confusing thing. I navigate that currently in my life. And so I think just being mindful and this is where talking to a therapist can help because you don't want to fall down the slipping slope of cutting out absolutely everyone that you've ever known in life and cutting out new people the minute they make one small mistake that isn't a deal breaker instead of just working through that and overcoming it. Because even though people aren't perfect and they will hurt your feelings by saying a wrong thing or doing a wrong thing sometimes, that doesn't mean that they're like the people in your past or going to become the people in your past. And that doesn't mean that you should cut them out and totally isolate yourself. Isolation is bad. There's good people out there who have good intentions towards you but nobody is perfect, so don't confuse the two. And when it comes to the very sometimes necessary step of setting boundaries or going no contact with certain people, it can be really hard to cope with because it's like the person died. And you have these urges like, maybe if I just say the right thing, we can reconcile and they'll treat me with respect and we can have this magical fairyland relationship. <laughs> um, but in all reality, you've probably done more than enough to try and make that happen. And you have to like stop at some point. And what helps with that, instead of feeling like, oh my God, this person doesn't love me because I'm blah, 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 negative thing. And oh, I must have done something to make this happen. Sometimes it can be so helpful to just understand that some people, and you don't need to necessarily know the reason why. It could be trauma, it could be personality disorder, it could be whatever. Some people are just literally not capable of loving others unconditionally or in a healthy way or maybe at all and they're just not capable and it's a lot easier and it's less personal when you just see it this way like they're just not capable than it is to think like about how you may have somehow caused that to happen. That way you don't have any of these really horrible beliefs like that their treatment of you or this no contact has happened because you suck and now you should hate yourself, you know? And it feels a lot better to see things that way because it's kind of a relief. It kind of lifts off all of this like, oh my God, what if I could just do this and this and this? And it just makes it so like, oh, well, this is how it is, you know? And maybe someday it'll change and maybe someday it won't and I'm happy either way. And you can grieve and your grief is valid, but you're not actively trying to change the situation or take blame for it if you truly aren't really in a position where you should take blame. It feels better to have compassion for the other person. Oh, they're just not capable for whatever reason of loving me in a healthy way. Than it is to harbor um, all of this resentment and negative feelings and grudge holding. But however, you cannot force that. You cannot skip going through those feelings that are valid of resentment and holding a grudge you can't just like skip them and spiritually bypass them. But it is nice if you have a goal of eventually getting to a point of forgiveness, but without rushing it because it's not something that you can rush. And a lot of lashing out, I forgot to say earlier, has to do with something going on in your psyche and in you that you have not forgiven yourself about and that's also causing you to lash out at others. Um, you know, I've had to deal with flashbacks of things that I regret recently and coming to that realization has helped me understand the ways that I was subtly lashing out at people um, because I have not fully forgiven myself about something that I've done in the past, especially if you've done something where you hurt someone else. A lot of the times you, do, you 
did that not intentionally or you were just acting with the level of consciousness that you had at the time and you can't hold yourself in the present moment in the ways that you've changed and the ways that you would never do that thing now and you're like a completely different person you can't keep imprisoning yourself as if you're the same person that did that thing that harmed someone in the past you can't keep holding yourself as your present self accountable there's so many inspiring stories of transformation where people maybe because of the environment they grew up in or whatever were harming others in some way and then they had this wake up time and now they've changed their life and totally transformed and they're a totally different person and now they're doing something that's positive and good that kind of maybe helps the very issue that they were a perpetrator of in the past or something or that just, you know, you're putting out something that positively changes people or the world. And that can help a lot too, if you're struggling with feelings of having a hard time forgiving yourself about something or feelings of pain from regrets. And I think there's a lot of pressure not to have regrets or a kind of belief in society that you shouldn't have any regrets, that you should just be like, everything was part of my beautiful journey and everything made me who I am today. And that kind of invalidates the fact that maybe you did something that you really feel bad about and you regret doing that thing. And you know, it's there's nothing like wrong with saying, if I could redo this again, I would not do that or I would not do it that way. That just shows growth. So, I don't know how I feel about the whole, like, I have no regrets thing. But that doesn't mean that your regret should eat you alive. You can have a healthy relationship with it that's like, yeah, I regret doing that. But I also understand where my consciousness level was at that time and sort of why I did that and that I'm not the same person that I was and that I can do these positive things to kind of offset it now in the present moment. And so I don't beat myself up for it now and I, you know, forgive myself. There's also a lot of work around the regrets of maybe not standing up for yourself, not leaving situations, not standing up for others, just not acting in the integrity that you would act in today where you have the knowledge that you have now. You probably have a lot to forgive yourself for self-betrayal, like you know, staying with a person who wasn't good for you for a length of time or, you know, going against your values or saying yes to things that you didn't want to say yes to because you were coerced and groomed, things like that. There's a lot of self-forgiveness around self-betrayal. You kind of have to learn to forgive yourself before you can authentically forgive others. And if you are in a situation where someone did something, but it's not a deal breaker for you and you don't want to cut them out of your life and they're overall a healthy, positive person in your life, but you're still having a really hard time forgiving them, it could be that you're having a hard time forgiving yourself for something and that's having an effect on your ability to forgive others. I won't say for sure, that's kind of just a thought. So where I'm at now, in nearing the end of 2021 with depression and mental health is that I literally have everything that I could ever want in my life. My life is going in a very positive direction, improving all the time. I have a really good relationship. I have friends that I'm, you know, opening up more to instead of isolating myself. I have everything that I need to do any of the dreams that I have. I have like everything that I could ever want and more in my life. I've manifested so many things. I have a vision for my future and a vision for what I want to be doing and I have passions. And you know, sometimes I struggle and sometimes I get loss of interest in things, but overall, overall things are very good. And truly the only thing that I struggle with is my horrible thoughts about myself and the way that they spiral to this place. That's my main thing. And it's helpful to know that I have the power to gradually overcome and work on this. 
but sometimes I can be really consumed by it and have a really off day. Sometimes I go back into old, really toxic behaviors and patterns and thought patterns, and sometimes I really need to reach out to someone to help pull me out of that. And I have to be like, okay, that's all right though. Other than that, my depression is often relating to Vistopia, which is being vegan in a non-vegan world. Knowing and having seen the cruelty on documentaries and firsthand that happens to animals at the hands of the dairy, meat, seafood, and egg industries. Watch the documentary Dominion, free on YouTube or at watchdominion.com. And not even getting into the bullying and threats and physical assaults that can happen to you if you are an activist that speaks up for those animals who can't speak for themselves. That's a whole other thing. But just the horrible feeling of going out and wanting to enjoy just walking around, looking in some shops and seeing all these products of animal abuse and leather and animal products being served on people's plates and just feeling like doesn't anybody see what I see? Doesn't anybody understand the suffering? Doesn't anybody care? And that can be very depressing as well. And that can really make me feel alone, but luckily I have really amazing vegan animal rights activists in my life that I can talk to anytime I need to. But I wanted to share that as well. Sometimes going vegan and living a more ethical life can be depressing because just knowing and finding out about some things about how the world is and the cruelties that go on is depressing. But you shouldn't avoid that because it's more important to stop inflicting that harm than it is to try and avoid every negative emotion. But being an activist, whether it's for animals or for humans, can really help you with a feeling of community, with a feeling of making a positive impact, um, having purpose, having just thinking about someone other than yourself because sometimes depression involves thinking way too much about yourself and your own problems and your own negative thoughts and it can be helpful to get out there and make a difference for someone else. So you have to have boundaries with it though and not burn out. So it's the next day and I wanted to add in a couple of things. The first being I struggle a lot as part of my depression with loss of interest in activities, particularly things like I don't enjoy listening to music near as much as I used to. Um, and just an overall sense of not being as excited or getting as much joy out of things. And I wonder if some of that is just to do with getting older and getting further and further away from the kid's self who's always excited about everything. But I think a lot of it is just the classic kind of symptom of depression. So if anyone has any tips or advice on how to deal with loss of interest in activities, that would be amazing please comment it down below. Another reason I do struggle with loss of interest in activities sometimes is that I'll get a negative criticism about say a drawing and then I won't wanna draw for like two months after that. Or like I used to put singing videos on Instagram and then I got one comment that was slightly negative and then I never really uploaded one since. So. I think that's also rejection sensitivity. And then yesterday, right after I filmed the bulk of this video, Psych2Go, which I don't know how good of a channel they are, but they put out a video about signs of avoidant personality disorder. And every single one that they mentioned in the video was like extremely true for me. So now I'm like, fuck, do I need to add another thing to my list of things? Or is it like, just all these different conditions overlap. I wanted to add that in there. I won't speak on it here because I need to do research on it. And another thing I wanted to mention post listening to what I all said yesterday is that there's a big running theme of perfectionism. Like when I play guitar and I feel like, oh my God, I suck at it. I'll get just one simple thought like, 
oh, I haven't been practicing lately. And that can spiral into not wanting to exist because it's like, well, it's so important to me to be good at this and I can't have any business doing this if I'm not good at it because there's some sort of like elite permission slip that we all kind of think we need to hand over in order to do any art, which is so sad because everyone should be able to have access to doing art. And it matters so much that we continue to show up and do our arts and our hobbies and our healthy activities instead of being self-destructive, especially if you have ADHD. And it's of course a way to express yourself, which is so important to be doing when you have depression. So I want to say my very unprofessional, and please don't take me too seriously, opinion about going on medication for depression and also ADHD, but mostly I'm talking about depression. I feel that, you know, I don't have a big trust in pharmaceuticals and big pharma, and I personally would not want to take any kind of medication unless I literally absolutely had to. So I feel like if you're not in danger of harming yourself, this might not be the best route to go, and I don't want to advise anyone, obviously, but I just, I've seen people on depression medications, I've seen them not really help much, not really work much, and I've seen people be on medications like Zoloft, for example, and just seem kind of numb to everything, which includes being numb to the good things in life and the good emotions. Um, I think we should be aware of like the negative side effects of medication. And I think medication and just taking a pill is never going to be a replacement of working on yourself and working through traumas and working through your thoughts. Um, so that's just how I feel. I'm more into getting to the root of the cause rather than putting a band-aid on things. There's also the concern that the medication will cause you to be more suicidal or that if you accidentally don't take it or mess up or go off of it that that can also be bad and I've seen people on something like Prozac really mistreat people while they were on it. I, I just don't have a lot of trust and I don't feel like it's the best route to go unless it's absolutely necessary. But what do I know? Because I think a lot of times medication is suggested to just help people, oh, get back on track, get back to going to your nine to five, get back to going to school, get back to being like everyone else, get back to not having these inconvenient emotions. And for that reason, I really hesitate with it. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to this whole video. I really hope that you found value and help from it and that it helps you in a positive way and hasn't made anything worse. And please talk to professionals above all else. Talk to therapists. I have the hotlines all linked below. It would mean a lot to the animals that live in this world if you could take some time to listen to the TEDx talk, Every Argument Against Veganism. I know you got time to listen to long stuff because you listened to this whole video. Do it. I am sending you the most positive healing energy and intentions to overcome your depression and transform and you are worthy just for existing. There's always someone to talk to. Have a really good day.